Hello everybody, John Parker here, Technical Director at the Arboricultural Association. Welcome back to Tree of the Best, here in uh, almost sunny Stonehouse. Someone lent me a GoPro this week, so I thought I'd take you out and about on a little adventure around this field. Um, there's a bit of a theme to uh, Tree of the Best 4, and that theme is pruning. We've already done one of these on pruning, but it seems quite appropriate to do one now to coincide with the launch of Virtual Arb Show, which is starting this week. And there's a bit of an international theme to this one as well. We've got Philip Van Vessenau from Canada, On Zhang from Hong Kong, and Ed Gilman from the United States, all giving their experiences of their own countries. And the first presentation is from Philip Van Vessenau and the 2019 conference, and his talk entitled, Reduce the Canopy, Retain the Tree. You enjoy that when I try and uh, find my way around this field and see what is over there in the corner. Thanks. i start with a few thanks. Uh, thanks to Vicky for that introduction. Thanks to the association for, for bringing me back. And thanks to all of you for being here this morning after a big night last night. And uh, I also wanted to thank um, Sir Worsley for that introduction. And, and I was really pleased to hear of all these initiatives that are going on, on on a national level, and especially that you didn't only talk about planting trees, which for this group I think was really good in your message because um, planting them's easy, but having them grow to, to large trees is, is, is a bigger challenge. And coming from Canada, where we have no federal support, no provincial support for urban forestry at all, and where urban forestry lies in individuals and municipalities, it's really, I'm always jealous when I hear these things. So, um, as Vicky said today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, pruning and um, title of my talk is Reduce the Crown and Retain the Tree. And just, uh, I always like to give a quick introduction. I like to say I've been hanging around trees since I was a little kid. And I took that passion for climbing trees to climbing rocks. And lo and behold, when I was doing my uh, undergraduate degree in arborist, came to our backyard. And the next day, I became an arborist because they were going to pay me to climb trees. It was amazing. And that was sort of the um, path to to where I am today, and, and it's actually, you know, a lot of times I talk about urban forestry and get, um, get involved in that, but um, pruning trees and working with trees is still a, a real passion of mine, so I'm happy to speak today on this topic. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to give a, a, a recognition to two people in the room who have been highly influential in, in my knowledge, especially with old trees and, and all things trees, and they're here today, so I'd like to thank Neville Fay for his um, mentorship and his friendship, and also Ted Green, who, who's been a, a real champion for trees and, and has had been so generous in sharing his knowledge and coming to Canada and trying to influence our, our environment. So thank you to both of them. I'm going to, um, just a quick outline of what I'd like to try and do in these next 40 minutes. thought I had an hour, then Simon told me, no, nope, you don't have an hour. So forgive me if I go fast. Um, I'm going to try and get through it to the end, but I'm, I'm going to look, you know, just a quick um, uh, look back at where some of the influences on my thoughts on reduction pruning come from, so a little bit about the old trees and natural processes, um, and then look at how crown reduction can help to reduce risk, enable us to conserve trees, and, and then um, actually most of it is I'm going to try to keep the text to a minimum and, and just go through some scenarios, some case studies, uh, to show some examples of where I've used reduction pruning with, with my colleagues in Canada. And, and as I've been, you know, looking at this topic, I've been very lucky to have some of my colleagues in different places send me other examples. And, and a wide range of, of scenarios where reduction pruning, I think, really does come into play and hopefully show some effective approaches. So, I would like to start with this. I'm not going to go through it. And like most people say when they show this, I hope that everybody in the room recognizes the benefits uh, of, of the urban forest. And, and you know, I, I like to say the urban forest is where the people live. And if we want to influence people about our passion for trees and forests, we've got to help them where they live. Um, and, and I worked uh, extensively with my colleague, Dr. Andy Kenny, in, in Toronto, which Cecil referenced earlier. And we developed this graphic a long time ago, just to try and emphasize that 
if we have a city full of trees, and we've talked about canopy cover and canopy cover studies, well, if you look down on a city and it was full of these trees, you'd think, well, we're doing pretty good. We have green everywhere. But actually, it's the large stature trees with the large canopy volumes which give these exponential more of these benefits that we all want to derive from these trees. So the thrust of my talk and, and of using this, this graphic today is that my experience is that we've fallen behind and, and, and where we are right now is we're, sorry, we're losing these trees and we're not doing well enough in getting these ones coming back up. So my focus on reduce the crown, retain the tree is let's try and keep more of these older trees, bigger trees where we can while we catch up and fill in that canopy volume um, that's so, so well needed in, an, in our urban environments. And, and my focus today is mostly on urban trees, despite my passion for those ancient trees in the forest. We just don't have too many of those. So quick you know, review back on heritage trees and conservation arboriculture. And uh, Neville uh, put this together with, with some of his colleagues, and I'm sure you're all aware of it. But we, from this, we understand that you know, trees, as they age, and get into those later stages, they naturally uh, start to get smaller. And you know, two terms which, which I've come to learn over the years, and these are just my definitions, but retrenchment is, um, is the first one. And it's a natural survival process for trees. Trees are amazing, they can survive for a long time. And retrenchment is, as, as Ted has said, you know, old trees must get smaller if they're gonna survive they need to get smaller. And we're all, I'm in Britain, so I think you all understand that aspect of it. And the other part is reiteration, and that when those trees get smaller, they have this amazing ability of reinventing themselves as a lower, smaller self, uh, and it's a survival strategy. So these, you know, the future tree is, is this growth lower down in the canopy. And, you know, from this, maybe we can learn that we can learn from nature and, and try to mimic that in some of our practices where it's appropriate. And, um, you know, there was some discussion yesterday about retrenchment uh, and, and, and how it's used and, and where it's going. And I just think one thing which, which, you know, I think didn't maybe come across or I'd just like to say is that my understanding of retrenchment pruning is that it's not for risk abatement, it's not to save the whole tree. The purpose of retrenchment pruning is to help stimulate the lower crown. And so the first pruning in a retrenchment pruning is to take a small bit from the outside of the canopy to try and initiate a lower crown. And in fact, the second round in a retrenchment pruning program is actually not to go back and then take a bunch more. It's actually to go back and because most times when you prune on the periphery of the canopy, you will get a proliferation of, of new growth. You actually have to go back the next time and thin that new growth to allow that light to keep penetrating while you start to develop that lower crown. And that's what retrenchment is. When we start to take bigger parts off, I, I think that's moving away from retrenchment and it's necessary sometimes for risk reduction and to keep our trees from falling apart. And so, I've had the chance to experiment a little bit here and there with retrenchment pruning. And as I mentioned before, we unfortunately don't have many old and ancient trees, but I work with a lot of nice trees. And this is one in the city of Toronto. Um, and it's, um, it was one that we actually did a tree pulling test on because it's got a driveway right beside it there. And, and in the past, they lopped off all the roots and it's got some decay. And when we did the pulling test, it, this tree was on the margins, but it wasn't, you know, a really drastically uh, reduced safety. So uh, I prescribed what, what I felt was a retrenchment pruning approach, and, and the contractor who I work with went and just did a little bit of pruning around the outside. And this was really one of the first times that I experimented with this. And then, this tree's quite far from where I live, and one day my colleague Larry called me up and he said, Philip, um, the client's called back. You said that, you know, we should come back in five years and revisit the tree and see whether it requires any more testing. He said, you've got to go back and look at that tree. He said, it's amazing what's happened. And so you can see here, when we first looked at the tree, it was pretty thinning canopy, uh, not very dense. You can see right through it. 
And four years later, this is what the canopy looked like. It's really invigorated the canopy. There's a lot more denser growth. And I think that you know, this, is, um, this is sort of the proof positive for me because, you know, as I mentioned before, I had lots of slides from and learning here and from, from Neville and Ted. But this is you know, one of the experiments that I've done with it and, and, and seen some really good results that this just minor pruning on the periphery of the canopy can have the effect of invigorating the tree and starting that, um, filling in that, that lower canopy. So um, I thought I'd try and show that slide rather than my series of slides that I've been showing for years from, from Nev and Ted, because most of my conservation arboriculture lectures are given in North America, where I've got a very steep path to try and convince people of these types of ideas. Um, the other place where I've, I've learned about the effect of crown reduction is, is in the realm of, of static tree pulling tests. And I've been working with uh, the folks from, from Germany since 2001 in this area. I started reading about it in the late 90s. And um, I embraced the approach. And you know, a tree pulling test, for those who haven't um, seen it before, just quickly, we have a tree which has an issue. with The development happened, and all the roots were cut on one side. And then they were worried about the tree falling on the houses. So um, we place an anchor up in the canopy of the tree. We have an anchor on the ground. We didn't pull with this vehicle. We used it as a, a weight. And then we lightly pull on the tree, and we can measure its propensity for uprooting or for breaking using, using some instrumentation. Um, and uh, you know, here we just, uh, just another graphic of it. We have a, we have a, a pulling uh, mechanism, a winch. We measure the force. We can measure inclination at the base. And we can also measure the strain of the fibers uh, in compression or tension. And you know, you've got to pull hard. This was uh, me on the, on the winch. Um, I got to do the pulling while my, my uh, younger colleagues, uh, who are more adept at the computer, were working away. Um, but from that, what I've learned is that because when we do um, these types of um, tests, we also run a, a computer analysis. And we model the crown. And we can model in the, in the um, software, we can model crown reductions and see what their effect is. And what I've learned is that oftentimes a very small amount of, of reduction on the periphery of the canopy at the top of the tree or on the outsides can have a significant increase in, in uh, um, the safety factors for the tree. So this is one of, of the examples, one of my you know, day to day examples with this. So who in the room, if they came up to this tree, would, would start to think about felling it? Anybody? Wow, that's great. <laughs> you would. Excellent. One person's brave enough to say so. Oh, there's another one. And, and, and I think that's, I think I asked that question. I'm, I'm glad to see not that many people put up their hand. In most crowds, I would see more. But I was brought to this tree because it's got a proliferation of, of um, fungi at the base. And they actually asked me to do tomography on this tree. And when I came to look at it, I said, well, we could do a tomograph, but I think we're more concerned about whether this tree might fall over with a proliferation of a root rotting fungi. Um, so we did a pull test. And here's the, the canopy before, um, when, before we tested it. And we, we used this sort of outline of the canopy for uh, doing our analysis. And um, you know the controversy about this tree, the, the city Put a, the inspector put a bit, big X on it. And, and then everybody on this street went crazy because they love this tree. And also, where we are in Canada, we have um, emerald ash borer. So you can see in the background here, there's uh, an ash tree that's already dead. There's another one standing there. And so in, in, on a street that's losing half of its trees for sure, they're really upset to see their, their beautiful oak going. So this was the kind of scenario where we get asked to, to bring in a further assessment. Uh, we don't do it every day. But when we were done, um, we modeled that you know, in order to keep the tree there, we would need to do um, this sort of reduction. And, and just to be clear, we didn't, we didn't actually ask for this part of the canopy to be taken away because it's the lower canopy. And we would have actually liked them to keep more of it. But we, this was the type of crown reduction that was required in order to retain the tree. And um, you know, it's, that's what it looked like from another angle. And we did this job 
seven years ago, and the tree is still there, and it's still looking good. And actually, surprisingly, I've never seen the fungi come back out at the base of the tree. Not to say they went away, but we've been able to retain this tree um, for quite a period of time. And actually, I got a request a few days ago for us to go back and test it again. So we'll see whether, um, that, whether it's still, um, the roots are still there, the canopy's still looking well. So, um, you know, the community was certainly really happy to be able to keep this tree for a little while longer. Um, and just one other scenario, uh, this was a, a job where I got asked to do a, an arborist report for this site, and I think you're experiencing the same thing here, where people are on a lot which had a small house, modest house with beautiful trees, now they want a monster house out to the edges of the property, and our protection policies are not as rigorous as yours, and we see these trees going missing. But on top of that, um, you know, 8,000 square foot house, they also wanted a, 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 a garage with a basement. And so um, I said, well, you know, I looked at the plans as you do with, as an arborist in a preservation plan, and I said, you either need to move this foundation three meters away from these trees, or you're going to have to remove them. And this row of trees is actually in, you know, some form of heritage trees. It's an old hedgerow. Uh, that was uh, a windbreak on, on the farmland. And as this town was developed, they actually made the road structure so that these trees could line the backyards between, between two, two properties. Um, so then, fast forward, I submitted a report. It got uh, through the planning process. And lo and behold, I got a call. And this is what I found. They didn't move three meters away, and they didn't take out the trees. And... Um, so, you know, I think most of us in the room would probably have a pretty good gut feeling about what this means for the trees. But, you know, at this point, the homeowner was, I love these trees. We have to try and keep these trees. You know, a little late. And, and I would also say the planning process really failed because in, you know, pretty clear English, I said there's one choice or another, and whoever reviewed this put it through anyway. So, the, you know, the blame wasn't only on the people that did this work. It's also on the planning process that enabled it. In any case, because we do polling tests, I said, well, you know, if you really want to try and keep them and want to know if it's possible, we'll do a polling test. And I climbed these trees myself on a Tuesday. And on, uh, I, I, I worked on the weekend to run the analysis. And on Monday, I called the folks um, uh, to, to give them the results that they should probably remove two of the trees. And they said, well, Philip, you remember the storm on Friday? Uh, well, this is what happened. <laughs> they reduced themselves completely. <laughs> um, and the trees not only fell over, they fell back onto the neighbor's property. So this was a bit of a mess. And I was very thankful that I never got involved in any of the legal schmozzle that happened after this because, quite frankly, they didn't want me there because my report said don't do this. So um, just a, you know, another experience with, you know, uh, reduction won't help in every scenario. I certainly... Uh, the only, the silver lining of this for me is that there were three trees and I said, you know, these two definitely had to go and this one could probably stay. These ones fell over and, and that one didn't. So it was kind of reassuring about our, our method at least, um, but not so reassuring for the folks who lived there. So those are a couple of the areas of influence in, in my thoughts about crown reduction. And really the rest of the talk, I just want to run through some, some, some scenarios, some case studies that I've worked on to show you where we've applied this. And, you know, I think it's clear by now that my thoughts are that we can reduce trees, and sometimes we have to, and, and, or we can, and without, um, you know, doubting ourselves or, or having too much wringing of hands, because we're trying to preserve these trees for the benefits that, that we accrue from them. So, some of the thoughts that I have about, uh, about this is that, you know, yesterday we had, you know, our, our thought leader, Ed Gilman, talking about corrective or structural or formative pruning, and it's certainly an option, or I wouldn't even say an option, it's an imperative for our young trees. But when we get to mature or more complex trees, um, we can't oftentimes correct them, but what we can do is try and improve them uh, from where they are to a better place so that we can keep them around um, for a bit longer. 
And, and if we do this correctly, because in, in most cases, uh, reductions aren't a one-time uh, event. As Henry said about pleaching, you know, once you start it, you have to keep going back. And I think in many cases, it's the same with reductions. It's a process. It's not a one-time deal. So if it's done correctly, each time you apply, we hope that we're compounding the improvement on, on the tree that we're working with. And a couple of other thoughts, um, you know, maybe the, the challenges of this, and I think this really is, everyone in the room would understand that, you know, it's what is the pruning dose? What's the correct one? How do we figure out how much or how little to take off? And, you know, shy of doing advanced and sophisticated assessments, which most of us aren't going to apply, and I certainly don't apply to every tree, we have to make some decisions. And, you know, if we make really large cuts, we can compromise the aesthetics of the tree, which to me is less important in, in many s in scenarios. But we, um, you know, we are going to affect the structure. And as we heard from some of the speakers yesterday, we could be affecting the function. Um, and you know, with that, the function aspect, and I, I definitely understand that we can affect the function. But once again, in some of these scenarios, if we're not doing some of these things, someone's just going to go and take the whole tree. So, you know, a, a tree with some impaired function and a, a reduced lifespan is better than no tree at all in many of these scenarios. And um, but large cuts can often be really helpful and, and necessary for short-term risk reduction. We've got, you know, like when we look at, for example, the lapsed pollards, and they're, they've grown these massive parts on, on, a, on a hollow stem. If we really want to keep it there, sometimes we've just got to make that bigger cut. And then small cuts, um, which, which I encourage, in some, in some cases may not have enough impact. How do, how do we know? So, you know, I'm not going to say I have the crystal ball, but I, you know, I've developed some ideas and that's what I'm trying to share. The one thing I do know is that if we reduce the leverage, generally we're going to have some effect on reducing the likelihood of failure. If I, if, I put, if I have a bunch of weight on, on, my, on my arm out here, uh, it, it pulls down on my shoulder. But if I put that same bit of weight right there, I don't even feel it. So that leverage, pulling the weight in closer, has an effect of reducing uh, the strain on the whole tree or, or the strain on the branch. So this is um, the first, first uh, case study or example that I want to share. And this is. Um, White pine, Pinus strobus, um, an iconic tree in Ontario. Uh, we're on the border of the Carolinian and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Forest. And this is a major component uh, of the Great Lakes um, St. Lawrence Forest. And regrettably, when um, our British forefathers came to Canada, they took away a lot of these trees to make masts for their, for their ships. And we had actually beautiful whole forests, the pineries, full of these uh, iconic trees. So I have a particularly fondness of these trees. This one you can see has two stems. And you know, we heard some, some discussion around codominance, and we understand that you know, those two stems can move apart. Unfortunately, you know, we do have unscrupulous contractors among us, among our brethren. And um, when I came to the scene, uh, two people uh, had come. Uh, told these people, well, this tree, because it, it's two stems, you've got to remove it. And of course, they gave them a big, big price. And they were kind of crestfallen, and, and they got a hold of me. And, um, you know, I looked at it, and I said, well, I don't think there was, you know, there wasn't included bark. Uh, there wasn't any sign of cracking. And, and it's a beautiful tree, and they didn't want to lose it. So we looked here, and instead of removal, we looked at, uh, and, and you know, we couldn't, we couldn't, as you know, Ed might say, for a for a younger tree, we couldn't subordinate one of one of them to make it better, so we had to work with what we had. So we looked at um, some reduction pruning, and so here we have the tree before, and here we have the tree after, and you can see that mostly in the upper canopy and in some other places we thinned out and, and reduced things, and really the purpose of this was to. Um, this tree grows in a, in, a, in a forested neighborhood, and my objective was to try and reduce the height of the tree a bit, perhaps enough that it sits below the rest of the forest around it so the wind could pass over it, and you know, that leverage force, a little bit of wind on the top of the tree creates a lot of sway and try and avoid that. 
So um, the top was thinned and reduced, uh, and, and we brought the height down below the surrounding trees. Uh, and that's looking up in the, into the canopy before, and that's uh, then looking at it after. And you can just see, I know that the light changed, but hopefully you can see um, a slightly thinned out and reduced crown. And we also added a couple of dynamic cables to this tree. And it is in the neighborhood where I live, and I go walking with my dog every day, and I see this tree, and it's again seven or eight years later, and it, it's still there. And, and what I'm really happy about is that, you know, the conifer really didn't um, sprout a whole bunch of new growth. The, the, the pruning dose, I think, that my colleague Ryan applied was, was fairly appropriate because it didn't cause a massive proliferation. And we haven't had to go back to this one yet. Um, this is another example. And, and, yeah, I just mentioned my colleague Ryan Redvers. When I originally started giving this talk, um, I asked him to join me because I wanted to I did a little bit more on the sort of the technical side of things, but I also wanted to have a practicing arborist along uh, to give his perspective. And Ryan is uh, a young guy in Ontario, and I never taught him any of this stuff. He just started to, to, to come to it himself. So this is one of his examples. It's a poplar tree. It grows between two properties. And, you know, I think many of us have experienced uh, issues with trees that um, have two owners or two people on either side. And this was one of those. Uh, Ryan's client uh, loved the tree, the benefits, the shade, uh, all of those things that it was providing. The neighbors on the other side hated it. They hated the fact that it dropped leaves, that it filled their gutters, etc. So Ryan was able to convince everybody that, you know, um, we're going to try and keep this tree somewhat under control. We don't want to lose it. We want to keep everybody happy. So he did a crown reduction. And so we started with um, you know, this is the outline of the canopy, and when he was done, it looked like this. So he brought it back just a little bit, um, thinned it out, and, and the point of this reduction, and, and again, I mentioned that oftentimes these treatments have to be repeated. We all know that a poplar is a pretty fast-growing tree, and we'll start again. And so it'll have to be repeated, but it was a solution that both sides could live with. So we managed to retain this tree uh, in, in the face of actually it, it, it being removed. Um, and Ryan, as I said, is, is pretty switched on and, and likes to look at, analyze the thing. So with this, um, with this pruning, you know, a lot of times when he does this stuff, he, he actually starts counting every piece and measuring it. And he had 36 uh, six to seven foot pieces between three quarters of an inch and one and eighth inch diameter. So, you know, no really big cuts, mostly things around the outside, um, and not, um, not a big impact on the, on the size of the tree, but enough, th this is a reduction to keep the tree in control, not let it get larger to where it was going to cause problems for the neighbors that didn't like it. Um, another, another example which comes from... Uh, from Ryan, and this is a willow tree, and I think most of you, this is uh, Salix alba, uh, weeping willow, and, and you know, we know that these trees don't have as strong wood as other trees, and they're also more um, prone to decay. Uh, so they're more challenging to work with. And what you can see is that at some point in the time, someone really did do a topping job on this tree. And really the whole canopy is regrowth from that. Uh, so you've got regrowth from topping cuts on a tree that has weak wood and poor compartmentalization. It's a bit of a challenge and a tree that's probably more prone to failure than, than others. So uh, Ryan, Ryan went and, and, and did one pruning and took out some of the dead and some of the uh, more problematic crossing and interfering. Um, that as it's, that the topping happened 10 years before he got there. And, you know, once again, the idea is that we can't correct this. You can't go back and put the top back on on a top tree. But if you care to take the time, you can, you can try to manage it. So um, Ryan is, you know, he's also a pretty good climber. He didn't use a lift to do this. He got out and did all the pruning by climbing and using tools. And um, there's what it looked like uh, before his second cut. And there's what it looked like after. So you can see, again, lots of cuts out on the periphery, 
small cuts bringing things in. And you can see the date at the top of this. It's December 16th, 2013. So he was pruning in the winter, which is probably uh, good, maybe. I, I'd have to ask Tony if that's phenolo phenologically correct for this species. But um, generally, we like to do that in our part of the world. Uh, we have, you know, like others, less pests, less spores. And um, despite the fact that most people in our country think you can't do anything with trees in the winter, arborists love to get work in the winter because they're sitting around and they, they don't mind going out there. But in, in um, December 2013, we had a, a massive ice storm. And so this is, uh, this is what it looked like from above. And Toronto sits right there. And so we had, for two days, we had this raging ice storm. Uh, and you, I don't know if it, if it reached this far as arborists, whether you saw some of the results. But this is kind of um, what it, this was actually a mild. <laughs> it looked, this looks beautiful, but you can see uh, these piles of branches everywhere. And in some places, it was much worse. Where, and I'll show a couple slides of that. But um, so just by happenstance, Ryan had been doing this pruning on December 16th. December 23rd, the storm came. And on the 30th, he went back to look. And this tree, uh, which had been topped and is all apicormic growth, really came through with, um, in flying colors and really didn't lose too much. So you know, we figured that was quite a good result for, for a tree that's you know, relatively fragile. So um, then another, another example, and, and just to show that I don't just talk about this, uh, this is the tree in front of my house. <laughs> And uh, so I had uh, an even more vested interest in this tree. And um, this is what I got when I, when I moved in. And uh, unfortunately, uh, several owners before me, um, uh, an uh, Eastern European fellow, uh, did what I would call a ladder pruning and uh, got up there with his chainsaw or maybe his handsaw or maybe even like we saw from Vivab, maybe just with an ax. But he took the top of the tree off and the whole canopy, again, is regrowth uh, from those topping cuts. And as well as that, this is um, Acer saccharinum, silver maple, also a weak compartmentalizer. So those old topping cuts on my tree are big, big holes. Now, from Vicky and my perspective, that's not all bad because there's a lot of habitat value from that. And so I have an interest in keeping this tree, A, because it shades my house and gives me urban forest benefits, B, because it's good habitat. And I like seeing the critters that, that, uh, that inhabit this tree. So um, we did the first crown reduction. We did pretty much a retrenchment the first time, just a light pruning over the whole canopy. And then a little more here. My house is down here. So the branches that came over the house, we did some bigger cuts. And you know, this was sort of early days for me, kind of experimenting. Um, Fortunately, the one that I, that, that I thought was most prone, which was this one, I put a cable in. Um, but, you know, I mentioned one of the challenges is dosing. How much is enough? You know, we, it, it's, it's tough. So, um, sure enough, I didn't get it right. You know, we learn by our mistakes. But this limb here, you can see, uh, we had a major uh, storm burst in the summertime. And, and it failed. In fact, I was away, and my son called, and he said, Dad, you know, you got to come home. This, I just heard this big bang. And sure enough, um, my tree on my front lawn failed. You know, a little bit embarrassing. The only redeeming factor for me was that I had made a heading cut on this branch, and the heading cut ended up about five centimeters from, from the front window of my house on the front porch. And you know, all I got was a little bit of a dent in my, in my gutters. But you know, so I was almost there, but not quite. But um, hopefully to, uh, to, the, to the conservationists among us, I didn't, you know, I'm not worried about a stub. I left it there. And um, sure enough, a little bit of growth still came up. There was still some cambial connection. But in the subsequent years, I've had um, you know, insects there. I've had uh, birds carve out a cavity there. I've had uh, nesting birds in there. And um, you know, it's not living anymore, but it's, it's providing habitat. So um, we went back uh, the next time. You know, and this, again, a repetitive process. So the next time, we, we did just a bit more. Um, here's what it looked like about 
three years after the first pruning, and we did get a lot of regrowth because it's a fast, vigorous tree. So we went back and tried to sort some of that out, and because of what happened, we took a little more off, um, off the canopy here. And this was also done the summer before uh, the big ice storm. And, and this, is, um, this is what the tree looks like looking from, from the roadside. And what I'm happy to see is that slowly but surely, we're starting to see that lower canopy start to appear. And I plan to live at this house for quite some time. And I had one day I had a landscape architect come and visit my wife to talk about um, uh, law or, uh, garden design. And he said, why are you keeping that nasty old tree there? You should cut it down. Uh, and she, she conveyed that to me. And I said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Um, so what I'm hoping is that you know, I can keep the tree and I can keep encouraging this lower crown and I'm hoping to slowly start to remove some of this uh, because I am, you know, because I have a tomograph, I've been playing around with it on my own tree and I've been observing that it's, it's definitely very hollow, although it's vigorous and it's putting on, it's putting on some more. But um, you know, I don't all, also I don't really fancy having another part land on my house. And, uh, the embarrassment that might go with that. But um, as I mentioned, this ice storm came along, and, and you know, these images give actually a more accurate portrayal of what it was like in some of our communities. We just had whole trees collapsing, uh, you know, streets covered. This was just a little north of me. I live close to Lake Ontario, so we had a, less of a dose of ice on our trees. And um, thankfully, my tree came through pretty nicely. I, got one, I had one branch on the ground, one fairly large branch, but it didn't hit the house, didn't hit anything. And you can see, you know, some idea about the ice accumulation here just on a, on a small twig. And if you do that across the whole tree, that, that sure is a load that the tree didn't plan for. Um, and as I mentioned, so the, there's, I've also, you know, I've been fortunate to, to travel around to different places and I'm always looking. Uh, so I was speaking at uh, the Australian conference, and I went for a wander around, and I found this tree. And of course, you know, from a distance I saw it, and I had to walk up and take a look. Um, the first thing I noticed was that, you know, it was really doing this lower canopy reiteration. It was, it was grow It had already started to grow into itself. But what attra what I what uh, attracted my eye, let's say, maybe didn't attract me, but was, you know, what was this? What were these big cuts up in there? When I got closer and I got inside the canopy, I saw this. So, you know, a major canopy. And, you know, that explained why we see what we see um, in terms of the pruning. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, that's pretty good. In a mun municipal environment, in my experience, when you see a cavity of this size and extent, it, it often is just straight to the bin, you know. So, uh, but here, they've reduced the canopy. I think they'll probably do some more here. The loading is greatly reduced on, on this area, and, and they value the tree. And it's an elm in Australia, so I imagine it probably has some heritage value because it was probably brought from here. Um, so that's another example of this uh, approach. Um, I've been collecting these types of um, examples from different places. So a colleague of mine, Michael Schlag from Germany, sent me these ones. Um, you can see a, a pretty drastic and ugly image in front of us of, of what happens on construction sites. And I know this is not altogether unfamiliar. But Michael said, well, we don't, you know, I guess the community asked him, you know, is there any way we can keep these trees? So, um, you know, they, this is the construction site. You can see the extent of the, of, of the activity and the stress on these trees. So what he did is he decided to do a crown reduction on these trees to try and perhaps balance the the, the shoot to root ratio to bring the trees down, um, maybe increase their stability, uh, and, and that was acceptable. And then a few years later, here's what they look like. They, you know, was temporarily, um, they were reduced for, for a purpose, and, and now they're growing back out and, and uh, seem to be thriving despite what was done around them. So another, another option where um, removal was avoided. And I see that I'm, I'm getting close to my time. So here's another one from, from Germany that a friend uh, sent me, a big willow tree beside the beach. On, and, and rather than, it, I guess it had experienced a failure, you can see here it's multi-stem at the base. 
And they went around and did a crown reduction, shortened up the top, shortened the branches, and kept the tree there, because on a hot, sunny day, they still want some shade at the beach. And then, I think it's one of my last examples, and, and I was really quite pleased yesterday. Henry, you might recognize this tree. Um, yesterday, Henry talked about it. It's the Zambique Tilia in, in my native homeland, the Netherlands. And um, these pictures were sent by, well, this is a Google image, but these pictures were sent by another colleague, and that's the same tree that you saw yesterday. And the interesting thing that, that uh, Henry mentioned was that um, there's a young tree growing inside this tree. So in this case, they did some reduction pruning, and, and here is the, the original canopy. You can see there's climbers up in the tree here, and um, that was after the pruning. And the point of this reduction was, first of all, this, this side here, you can see this big part, that's the original canopy. And one thing is that the new canopy is shading out the old canopy. The other thing is, as, as Henry men, hen, mentioned, and I like the way he described it, the young girl is, is squeezing out her grandmother. And so maybe by reducing um, you know, the function and the growth of this tree, we might prevent it um, a little longer from, from destroying the grandmother. And then quickly, you know, the other side of this is what we shouldn't do. So this is, you know, what we see oftentimes is, is instead of starting at the top and reducing the tree to make them smaller, they went from the bottom up. And, you know, my eyes found this. You know, you get these long extended branches, lots of sway, and they break. And um, another example, this, these were in, in New Zealand. Here's an oak tree here, and you can see this, or here, and you can see this branch comes all the way out over the path. When you look closely, this is you know, what I would call the classic klausmatic hazard beam. You could already see the crack happening. And I think this was a, really a candidate for either a prop or a reduction. And, and you know, one last example that I saw you know, outside from the hotel in New Zealand. And you can see in this tree here, here's, here's the map of an old failure that looks pretty much like this. And, and you know, so they had this failure. It's telling me, don't you know, do something, and, and what have they done? They've lion-tailed it and left the whole canopy out there. So um, what I've heard is that there's quite a resistance in New Zealand to reduction pruning, and I think, you know, it could be um, not, not favorable. And again, in another park in, in, in Auckland, I did a walk about, I saw this tree that had failed, I saw this tree had failed. From a conservation arboriculture perspective, that's okay, but this is a highly used public park, and you know those failures, they were just lucky that they didn't happen with, the, with a valuable target underneath it. Um, so reducing leverage, bringing in the canopy to reduce loading. Uh, you saw this graphic yesterday from Ed. His name's at the bottom there. Um, you know We can do this reduction pruning to um, reduce the load on the ends and, and reduce the likelihood of failure. And in, in some cases, we may be replicating this sort of natural limb shedding or the retrenchment process. And um, so there's another willow. <laughs> so a couple of, a couple of last thoughts uh, to try and finish on time. I see the red light flashing at me. You don't see it. Uh, sometimes we need to help old trees get smaller. Sometimes we might want to help them just not get bigger too quickly. And, and sometimes we need to make big cuts to reduce the risk. But the challenge, of course, is deciding that dose and then following through. And so perhaps through this discussion, you know, you might consider if you're a contractor working arborist that when you're approached for a removal, for all the reasons I've talked about, maybe you can apply and sell a reduction instead. One of the good reasons for doing that is that you still have a client when you're done and you can go back. So you save money, save trees. And just remember that it's a progressive and long-term application of these methods instead of a removal or a one-time correction. So thank you very much for your attention under the stress of last night. And I stand between you and your stimulation at the coffee. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed that one. I'm still walking around the same field. Next up is uh, On Zhang from Hong Kong. And his presentation is about pr experiences of pruning stonewall trees in Hong Kong. Enjoy. Okay, so uh, good morning everyone. I'm On from Hong Kong. So uh, On is this, oh yeah, shit. On is this word, yeah, On. So um, 
I'm from the uh, Green Land Landscape and Tree Management section of the Hong Kong SAR government of China. So uh, I'll be here to talk about the uh, pruning strategy of a uh, special type of tree in Hong Kong, the stonewall tree. So uh, before I talk about the topics, uh, because you may, some of you or most of you may not be familiar with the Hong Kong, so I'll talk about something about my office. Um, my section, the GOTMS, uh, established in 2010. This, the establishment of this section uh, is to champion a new and strategic policy on greening landscape and tree management with a view to achieve a sustainable development of greenery in Hong Kong. Uh, please, uh, sorry that I'm usually speaking Cantonese, so I have to look at the script. Um, <laughs> As the management of trees in Hong Kong divides among uh, a number of the, uh, departments, uh, for example, for the trees along the, high, uh, along the expressway, it will be uh, managed by a, a department, and the trees in the parks will be managed by another department. So one of our jobs is to have a central coordination of the uh, government works on greening and landscape planning and design. Another work is to promote a quality-oriented approach to have tree management, including uh, uh, one of our major tasks, the tree risk assessment and management. And then uh, we, we also try to enhance the training and also the public education to the public and also to the uh, uh, stakeholders in the industry in order to improve uh, the professional standard in the industry. So uh, back to today's topic, I will talk about um, firstly how important trees are important in our community in Hong Kong. And then I would um, I'd talk about what is really a stonewall tree. Why, what is, why are they so special in our community? And then I will share with you some of our uh, example of pruning works done on stonewall tree. And lastly, some insights on areas that require further study in the future. So um, this is a map from the NASA at Earth at Night uh, in 2016 showing lights that are visible at night on Earth's surface. So in this little circle here, it is the approximate area of Hong Kong. And within this little area, um, um, you can see there is a very developed part of the world. Uh, every building and uh, a, a population of around 8 million are compacted into this area of around uh, 1,100 kilo, square kilometer. And not to mention there are around 800,000 registered vehicles running around in the city. So it is a very busy city. Um, some of you may have been to Hong Kong and know that this is a very compact city. Most of the streets and the road uh, will be used by pedestrians or vehicles uh, nearly 24 hours a day. As the city was built uh, along hilly and developed the countryside, the community has a very close relationship with the uh, uh, trees in the forest. In addition, um, for the urban parts of the city, are not, a huge number of trees were planted every year uh, so that every day in our life, we are living along with the trees. Um, general general uh, public uh, appreciate the existence of trees, uh, um, including the stonewall tree. They have deep engagement uh, in preserving each tree with the community um, because those trees have been there for a long time, witnessing the development and also the change of the city. Moreover, in a, a, a well-developed city like Hong Kong, in which uh, concrete buildings are everywhere, these urban greeneries are precious in our life. Um, However, as we are living close with this tree, uh, there will be um, inevitable conflicts with the growth of the trees. And therefore, the government and also the community are trying their best to understand and preserve these resources. Um, to explain why there are stonewall trees in Hong Kong, I have to start from the history of, a little bit about the history of Hong Kong. Uh, because of the topography of Hong Kong, um, there were many slip slopes uh, with scarce 
supply of land for our uh, development of the city. And therefore, during the early, early city development stage from 1850 to 1950s, uh, Many natural slopes were cut and artificial retaining wall were built to create terrace that can allow space for development. And therefore, uh, the stone wall starts to appear at that time. Uh, before the common use of concrete and cement, rocks were used, used to build the retaining wall. Um, the assemblage of the rocks and the bricks are uh, therefore so-called the stone wall or the masonry wall. And types of rocks used in building this wall include uh, volcanic rocks or the granitic rocks. And majority of this stone wall can be found on an island called the Hong Kong Island here, uh, circled by the yellow in here, uh, on this Hong Kong map. Yeah, Hong Kong Island of Hong Kong. So um, between the rocks on the stone wall, there are some gaps. Uh, creating a very special niche for the uh, uh, trees or other plants to grow. Uh, species like ficus, the, the uh, Chinese Spaniard tree, uh, they have very aggressive wood system so that they can search and penetrate into this gap uh, and grow downward to seek for uh, wooding space or water source. A survey done in 2015, there, are around, uh, there were around uh, 500 stone wall with 1,200 stonewall tree on them. And here's the map showing parts of the Hong Kong island where we can find the stonewall. And among these 1,200 tree, uh, they are mostly dominated by uh, the Chinese manga. Um, Ficus tree contribute, contribute around 80% of the whole stonewall tree population. And why? Because, uh, because uh, uh, the figs of, are produced by the ficus tree will be consumed by birds or other, other vectors, and then the seed will accidentally be put on the wall. Um, in addition, a ficus tree is a very fast-growing species, tree species, and therefore it can very easily grow on the narrow niche on the uh, stone wall. So um, as I said, that uh, stone wall tree are mostly ficus tree, and they can grow very huge, even on the stone wall. Um, here's two examples found in Hong Kong that have very magnificent uh, stone wall: one on the Fourth Street and one on the uh, King George V Memorial Park. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, Hong Kong citizens are very uh, uh, living close with this stone wall tree. But however, we have uh, very limited knowledge about the tree, especially the structural stability of these stonewall trees. We basically characterize the uh, stonewall tree into four types based on their uh, wood attachment. For the first type, the type A, uh, we can only find surface attachment of the wood on the wall. And the type B, we can find some more woods at the top of the wall. For the type C, we can find some uh, roots at the, at the crest of the wall. And the type D, you can find roots everywhere on the wall. So uh, in general, we think that for the first two types, the type A and type B, a wood attachment has a less favorable condition because it seems that uh, the, the, uh, the attachment is less firm than the other two. Um, however, there are some restrictions in determining the wood attachment for this stone wall because most of our grounds in Hong Kong are paved by either uh, a cement or bricks. And therefore, if it is uh, difficult to examine with, uh, how this wood spread. And sometimes the gaps between the stone wall will be filled by cement. And therefore, it, making it even more difficult to de determine whether the woods have penetrated into the gaps of the stone wall. And in, that, and in addition, it is not well known whether the stone wall can support the tree because at the very first beginning, the stone wall or the retaining wall is just meant to be there as a retaining wall. And therefore, we don't know whether the wall can uh, actually sustain the load of this large uh, stone wall tree. 
And um, Hong Kong is uh, at the region of a subtropical climate uh, uh, area. And therefore, there are many frequent typhoons uh, during summertime. For example, in 2018, there was a super typhoon called the Mankut uh, uh, impacting Hong Kong with a maximum gust speed of around uh, 215 kilometers per hour, which is a, a, a approximately equivalent to a uh, character 4 hurricane, uh, I suppose. In addition, um, Hong Kong has a uh, pretty high any rainfall. In 2018, the total annual rainfall was uh, 2,100 millimeter, which is around three to four times the annual rainfall in London. And so um, the typical subtropical climate in Hong Kong causes a great physical stress to the tree. And uh, as you know that the uh, stone wall tree only hinge on uh, an unknown support on the stone wall. And therefore, in the recent year, there are um, quite a number of failure cases happening, happened in Hong Kong. For example, in this case, uh, the stone wall collapsed during the super typhoon that I mentioned. And however, the stone wall is still intact. And the next case, uh, another stone wall collapsed during another typhoon uh, happened in previous year. The trees uh, collapsed with the stone wall also uh, collapsed. So um, what, what I'm saying is here that we don't really understand the structural stability of the stone wall and also a stonewall tree. Um, so to conclude a little bit about the situation in Hong Kong, and we are facing three major challenges. Uh, the first one is, uh, as we are living close with the trees, including stonewall trees, we always have some conflicts. And the second challenges we are facing is the, um, we don't really understand the structural stability of this kind of tree. And the third uh, challenge we are facing is the, uh, typical subtropical climate in Hong Kong. So as to better manage the uh, stonewall tree, uh, our section has uh, published the management guideline for stonewall tree. And in that guideline, it is very simple, actually. Um, it's just recommended that for this uh, stonewall tree, uh, no more than 25% uh, of the tree crown should be pruned every year. Uh, and the pruning scope should just be limited to removing defective parts, uh, to rectify imbalanced uh, tree crown, to uh, maintain an optimal size of the crown, although I we really don't know what is optimal size, <laughs> um, and to provide adequate uh, clearance for the traffic and the utilities. So this is basically what the uh, guideline said. So, um, our pruning strategy for stone wall, and there are three major directions. Um, first one is to regularly maintain the crown size. As inspection will be conducted on a half year basis, which is very frequent inspection for a tree in Hong Kong because our trees are everywhere and people are everywhere. So um, the trees will be inspected in, on a half year basis. We will have a very updated understanding of the tree condition, as far as we know. And the crown size will be managed as a preventive measure to conserve the tree. And the second one is to phase the pruning works uh, because sometimes live branch removal is not desirable on mature tree like the uh, stonewall tree. And only necessary work should be carried out. Sometimes there will be some large, a relatively large scale uh, pruning works that is necessary. As to minimize the stress and the damage to the tree, we will face the um, pruning works and uh, complete in different years. And the last one is uh, what the uh, guideline said, to only remove the defective branches after the above two necessary works. Um, as I mentioned that a uh, ficus tree, the Chinese mangan tree, is a very fast growing species. Under favorable condition in Hong Kong, the tree, the ficus tree, can grow around several feet per year, I mean the crown, uh, which add a substantial load to the wall. For example, this is not in Hong Kong, this is in uh, Cambodia, if you have been to there. Um, uh, you can easily find a magnificent ficus tree, although not the same tree species in Hong Kong. Um, find this tree on some Asian building. 
uh, the roots of this uh, ficus tree can en 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 engulf the uh, structure and sometimes crushing the structure underneath it. And therefore, our uh, uh, regular crown size management uh, is essential to p uh, maintain the tree at a proper size. So the major purpose of uh, crown size management is to, um, as a preventive measure to, maintain, uh, to preserve the tree. Um, as I said, uh, structural stability and also the low capacity of the wall and the stone wall are not well understood. And therefore, uh, as a preventive measure, the crown size is suggested to maintain at a certain level or slightly reduced in order to preserve the tree. Um, the pruning works also helps to reduce the, crane, uh, the wind cell effects of the crown and, uh, and also reduce the load on the branch union and the anchor point on the stone wall during summertime uh, when there are many frequent typhoons happening during summertime. And most of the stone wall trees under this management are mature tree. And therefore, um, large pruning wounds um, and also heavy pruning uh, are not desirable to the tree. And therefore, we limited the, uh, further limited the percentage of pruning to around 15% for a niche uh, annual pruning program. And in addition, there uh, is frequent use underneath the tree. Um, and therefore, uh, adequate light penetration is essential. So um, here's the first example in Hong Kong that we have done some pruning works on it. Um, it is tree that uh, um, have a wood attachment of type B, which means that uh, it has some surface wood uh, growing on the wall and also some ground wood at the top. Uh, after all, it's not a very favorable uh, wood attachment for a stonewall tree. However, the, uh, and, uh, the biggest issue for this tree was that uh, there should be a big branch here. But uh, during a, a, another typhoon, uh, the, big, the big branch just failed and leaving an empty space between the remaining branches. So it leaves the tree with a asymmetrical, uh, asymmetric uh, crown with limited branches for pruning. So an excessive pruning of the existing branch may further lead to more stress to the tree. In addition, after the fa failure of the middle branch, uh, it was revealed that some branch, I mean the remaining branch, were line tailed during previous operation. So this is a better uh, picture to show the, the line tailing issue of this tree, I mean this two branches, the line tailing issue. So the objective uh, of pruning works for this tree is to prevent the splitting of the remaining branches and also to uh, reduce the crown load and to reestablish the ground structure of this uh, tree. However, I said that um, uh, there's, there were uh, limited branches to be pruned and because of the major branch failure that happened during typhoon, excessive pruning may simply kill the tree. And therefore, a pruning percentage of less than 10% uh, was suggested on this tree in order to reduce the end load of the branches. So um, this is a line tail that uh, 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 banyan tree and therefore the most of the weight was concentrated at the end of the branches. And therefore in order to reduce the end load, we have to select uh, some branches for pruning in order to reduce the load. And in this case, um, uh, we selected branches with a sign of co-dominance. For example, in this middle one, we planted to cut off uh, either one of the uh, co-dominant branches. And for some branches, uh, we think that they have less promising future, which means that there are really low leaves on it. We, will, uh, also, uh, we, we did also prune them off um, in order to re further reduce the crown load. For example, this one. Uh, the branches with really no uh, uh, other leaves on it. And for a stone wall tree, as most of the stone wall tree are leaning towards the, the row, and therefore the length of the branches uh, was, an also, was another issue. The longer the branches and 
the greater the leverage. And therefore, some of the branches are proposed to be shortened in order to effectively uh, reduce the leverage. For example, this branch is growing towards, growing towards the row and uh, growing laterally. And therefore, uh, in order to uh, uh, more efficiently or more effectively reduce the uh, leverage, we reduce the branch right here in order to protect this branch from speeding at the joint, uh, the branch union. So um, before and after the, uh, the, the, the three operations that I mentioned, uh, some selected branches were reduced, thin or shortened, um, um, making the branch have less potential to have uh, failure in the future. Um, we kept the epicomics, the water spouse, in between the branches because, as I said, it, is, uh, it was a tree that has been through a major branch failure in order to uh, reconstruct the uh, uh, tree crown structure, we have to keep the water spout for future development. Um, so uh, this is the uh, tree that just after the uh, major tree failure, and here is the tree at the current status. This is still not a very good tree. Yeah, after the tree uh, major branch failure, it is still trying its best to become a proper tree. And um, as I said, we kept, we kept the uh, water spout from, uh, for the, the own development in order to replace the middle missing part of the tree. And we can foresee that uh, the pruning works will have, to con will have to be continued for years in order to restore the structure and the appearance of the tree. And uh, as Vicky said, uh, be patient and let the time do the work. And apart from minimizing the load of its uh, branch by reducing the crown size, uh, Cobra, Cobra's uh, supporting system was also installed in order to uh, in interconnect the remaining branches to further secure these branches and allowing the branches to uh, uh, have a certain extent of motion in wind. So uh, this is an example about the uh, crown size management works. And the next one is the, uh, to face the pruning works. Um, as every living branches, every living branches are a source of uh, energy production and every pruning wounds will bring stress to the tree and become a potential entrance for fungal infection or insect infection, especially for subtropical sub region like Hong Kong, we have many fungal infection. And therefore we try to minimize the pruning works every year in order to protect tree. Um, and therefore dividing the pruning works into different phases uh, for different years can minimize the stress that we bring to the tree. Um, here example that here is an example of a phase that uh, pruning works that we did. Um, it is a stone wall tree that uh, attached to the wall with uh, some surface woods and also limited um, wood on the crest. Um, um, and also it is a tree that has a very huge crown spread of around 15 to 20 meters depending which year you are looking at the tree. And um, this is a very big crown uh, for this tree uh, living on the edge of the wall. And also the crown is very dense. And therefore the wind cell effects was huge and therefore we planned to reduce the crown size and also to thin the crown in different years of uh, our, our pruning works. So the, for, for the first year, uh, the central part of this crown was proposed to be reduced. The reason why to select this part is because you may, you may notice uh, on the photo that we want to eliminate the potential that this branch may affect the lamppost nearby. Um, the branches grow very close to the lamppost and sometimes during windy day, the branch swing it around and it will a, uh, damage the lamppost. And also the branch will shade the light from the lamppost. And therefore, the pruning works uh, kept the branch away from the lamppost and tried to eliminate that imminent uh, risk to nearby utilities uh, by pruning one of the branch <coughs> here. 
it should be something here, and, and we put that array so as to uh, eliminate that risk. And as I said, that a crown node is a very important issue for Stonewall, and therefore we selected another branch to be pruned in order to reduce the load of the crown. It was a long branch with a considerable amount on, of leaf on it, which is here. Uh, we pruned that array. And actually, a diameter of around five inches or something like that. Um, pruning of these two branches, the previous one and also this one, uh, contribute around uh, around less than 10% of the crown size. As I mentioned, that we want to limit the pruning percentage to less than 10% for this tree and for most of this uh, stonewall tree. And therefore, the pruning works for this year stopped here. So for the next year, um, as I said, uh, we, we want to further reduce the crown size of a stonewall tree in order to preserve the tree. We select two paths uh, a path away from the where we have the previous uh, tree operation. We select two paths on this uh, tree to have the pruning in order to further reduce the crown load. One big branch was pruned from the east side of the crown in order to substantially reduce the crown load. In addition, uh, these two uh, these branches has a kind of, a, a, again, a sign of co-dominance, and therefore uh, it may be necessary to subordinate or to remove the branch in the future anyway. So uh, that branch was removed. And another part uh, of the crown, the, east, the west side, the opposite side, uh, was selected to have some pruning works. Um, the, another reason to select these branches to be pruned is because we want to uh, promote the development of the central leader because this branch is trying to, uh, its best to grow high and therefore it may replace the central leader of this tree in the future and therefore we want to keep that, uh, we want to prevent that from happening and therefore we prune this little branch away. So this is it. And after the pruning works, uh, here's the tree before the two years pruning works, um, which I've shown you uh, before. And after the pruning works, uh, actually the tree looks the same. Nothing has been done on the tree. But uh, if you notice something on this tree, uh, the crown size is actually a bit smaller than before. And also the density of the crown is, uh, should be less than two years before. So we do this kind of pruning works not just to reduce the crown load, the crown density. We want to keep the appearance of the tree because if we not keep the appearance of the tree like the year before, uh, public complaints will come very quickly. So um, therefore, you have to keep in mind that we uh, one side we have to reduce the crown size and the crown load, and on the other side. We don't want to uh, bring in more campaigns from the public. And another direction of our pruning strategy is to only remove the defective parts. And it is a very simple concept because we want to eliminate the hazard of the public, to reduce the crown load, and also to improve the appearance of the tree. So um, removing defective branches from where it may impact the public is a very simple concept to reduce uh, or to eliminate the risk to the uh, general public. And therefore, uh, in this case, there uh, was a very small little dead branch on the crown. But in Hong Kong, I can guarantee you that uh, if someone found this little branch on the crown, probably campaign will come again. So we put it anyway, it will not really reduce the crown low, it's a very small branch, but it will hit someone and injure that person. Even if there is a dead branch that is f very far away from the public, we will put that away too because uh, we want to reduce the crown load. And every single dead branch or branches are uh, important to us because the pruning of these branches can further reduce the crown load. And the third example I, uh, I want to tell you is that uh, the pruning of, uh, of a desktop, which is here. Um, Usually, this kind of stuff in Hong Kong will degenerate over time, which will disappear uh, uh, like a few years 
later. But however, why we put this little stop away? It will not cause any uh, 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 hazard to the public. Uh, the removal of this little stop can improve the image of the tree, and more importantly, it can give the public a feeling that you are doing the great work to manage a tree, and the government is uh, trying their best to take care of the tree. So as I said, uh, in Hong Kong, there are many trees, and every citizen uh, live along with the tree. If I'm the person that walked by this tree and found there's a very big uh, degenerating stop on the tree, I'm a question whether the government is actually taking care of the tree. So as a government point of view, we will put that away, even though it will, it will not uh, reduce the crown or will not eliminate any risk to the public. So uh, the removal of defective, punch, defective branches not just improve the tree appearance or reduce the crown law or to eliminate risk to the public, uh, it promotes our public perception of our tree management works. So um, to summarize a bit, uh, uh, so the current uh, pruning strategy in Hong Kong uh, based on the unique condition in Hong Kong, like the weather condition, like the frequency of use under the tree, or the special features of each uh, stonewall tree. For example, for the lion-tailed uh, stonewall tree that I mentioned about, we kept the epigomic growth for years, even though it doesn't look very good. Uh, and also we faced some relatively large-scale pruning works. And, and to go a bit, we will we, remain we flexible in uh, establish uh, the pruning program for each of the stonewall tree based on their own situation. But however, as I said very early in my presentation, we have a limited understanding about the uh, stonewall tree, especially the structural stability and also how to determine the load capacity of the stonewall and also the wall. Um, this is not fully understood, and therefore, one of our direction is to understand the stone wall um, from an uh, engineering point of view, to try to understand how the stone wall, wall tree lives on the stone wall. And, and another direction, we are uh, now testing some technology on the stone wall to monitor the tree condition. And for example, in this little picture, there are two devices they are both motion sensor. Uh, we install the motion sensor on the tree, trying to monitor uh, the tree motion during windy day and how the tree reacts to our previous pruning works, and try to learn more about the stone wall. Um, because we, if we better understand, understand the stone wall, we can minimize some unnecessary pruning works or excessive pruning works, and and moreover. Uh, we can be able to proactively improve the stone wall tree structure because at the current state, we are just doing some passive preventive approach uh, management works on the stone wall tree. So in the future, if we better understand the uh, stone wall tree architecture and structural stability and how does it respond to the environment, we may be able to have a new approach to manage the tree. So uh, of you may be able to help the Hong Kong government in management, managing the stonewall tree. Um, so uh, after, before I end my presentation, I have to thank some of the colleagues from the tree management departments, especially the architectural service department, which provides me uh, the information on the stonewall tree. And two persons, Samuel Lam, Dr. Samuel Lam, and Florence Cole, which are my bosses. And therefore, they, their names should be here. And the last, but not the least, are uh, my section, the Greening uh, Landscape Tree Management, oh, sorry, section, not department, who gave me the flight ticket here. So uh, this is the end of my presentation, and I hope that no matter in Hong Kong or in the other parts of the world, people, trees should be living in harmony. Okay, and this uh, QR code is actually f uh, for assessing our government office I mean the section, my section, the website of my section, and therefore if you are still uh, interested to know more about the management works, the tree management works in Hong Kong, you can feel free to access the 
that website. So thank you. And the final presentation for this Tree of the Best is from Ed Gilman, also from the 2019 conference. And Ed's presentation is about formative pruning experiences. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So there's, there's four or five different places to get more information about formative and other, other types of pruning. On my website, if you simply Google Ed Gilman, you go to my website. We have little cue cards that you can print off. The ISA is most recent, just off the press, about two or three weeks. The BMP, Best Management Practice, about 60 pages. For your, more of your reading pleasure with lots of photographs is this little booklet for 25 bucks at the ISA. And this one is for sale outside. And I have no clue how much it is. Uh, I think they might have this one as, as well, if I'm not mistaken. I may have seen that. So there's four places in the website, and that's pretty much my best shot. But we, we, build, we, we will keep uh, or bring you up to date with some, some examples of, of things here. And you know, in the States, we call this structural pruning, formative pruning here. Uh, so it's the same basic uh, concept. So first, some definitions. The leader is that big thing in the middle. It's typically some place in the center of the trail. It doesn't have to be. It could be any. It's bigger than everything else. That's the key factor. We're just in definitions now. Reduction cut is what I heard reference to a few moments ago. Uh, drop crotch cut, we used to call it a drop crotch cut. Uh, we've dropped that expression now, and we now call it a reduction cut. But it's, it's removing, at a union, it's removing the larger of the two and retaining the smaller. Very simple concept. On the other hand, a removal cut or branch removal cut takes off the smaller out of union and retains the larger. So removing a branch from the trunk, for example, very simple. So those are the terms used in the, in the US, in North America, really. And then aspect ratio. Lots of things have aspect ratios. The word was first coined in first reference I saw to it was in the forestry literature back in the 70s or maybe earlier citations. I didn't go, go farther back. Aspect ratio on all electronics is this ratio compared to that. Ornithology uses it. It's the bird wing length versus the, the depth of the wing, if you will. Airlines, same thing. Aeron aeronomics, uh, aeronautics. And so in, in trees, what it is is the diameter of A compared to the diameter of B. So this would be a small aspect ratio. And this would be a large aspect ratio. So it's, it's a very simple concept. So then interior branches, those are typically the ones we leave on the tree. There was a good example or two of, of some lion's tail trees by the speaker from, from uh, Hong Kong today. So this is exactly the opposite of, of that. Uh, this would be retaining the low interior branches. And then the periphery branches, this is the pruning zone, typically where most of uh, arboriculture is performed uh, out, uh, out there. This would be a good example of a, a well-managed tree where one of the objectives, at least in some landscapes, if not many, is to keep uh, branches, especially those that are going to grow into something like a traffic light, a building, etc., and may have to be removed later. Keep them small by not allowing them to grow uh, long. And so aspect ratio, we had some more time. I would show you some nice, a couple of nice videos of, of pulling apart a, what we think is a stronger union compared to a weaker union. We don't have uh, that kind of time right now. But notice that when the aspect ratio is, is smaller, the, uh, the, the strength of that union is going to be uh, higher. So various people have done uh, this kind of work uh, back in 04, we did some. It was followed up by, by some of our colleagues that uh, many of you might know the names of in, uh, in the US. So in this particular Acer, the smaller branch on the lower left, it took, uh, in this case, about twice the, the stress, the mechanical stress to pull that uh, out than uh, then to separate the two codominant uh, stems. And you can put a nice graph to this, uh, how you would read this, and this was in the Journal of Arboriculture, as it was called back then. This would be a small branch on a big trunk. 
And as we went toward codominant stems, this would be what we pulled was the same size as what we're leaving. Sort of this situation uh, would be here. And you notice that the stress to break that branch junction uh, reduced as we went from a small aspect ratio to a large aspect ratio. So this has been done up to branches in the three to four inch diameter range now. And it's, to me, the most interesting and intriguing part of a tree. You know, here you see some decay that's uh, showing the retained branch cores. And these are extreme. This is probably a conifer of some type. This is extremely small aspect ratio. And you can see why those junctions never fail. So if we look at the history of fruit crop production and nut crop production, at least in North America, Back in the 50s and 60s, most growers of apple, malus, went to the central leader system with small diameter branches or small aspect ratios. So if you go back into the old literature in the 30s and 40s and 50s, most of it came out of Cornell University. <coughs> and the reason why they went to this is probably pretty obvious. When those branches are laden with fruit, when the aspect ratios are big, they learned that they, the trees were more likely to fail. So you can go through, the, this is a North Carolina, but you can go through uh, most portions of North America that grow apple and, the wall, and see this. Um, the walnut, some pistachio farmers, almonds, and some others are also going to this system. Bonsai, if you look at some of the collections, this is Montreal Botanic Garden last year. Many of those, in fact, there were one or two I found without a dominant leader, but most of the 200 and some odd bonsais they have have uh, the dominant leader format. Here's a tree, and, and I just heard today John mentioned this is a couple of blocks from the tree that John spent a lot of time on. A couple of blocks away is this tree, and I'm calling it 700 years. It, it, it's probably closer to 600, so I apologize for that. I got the wrong number on that, but this, this tree is not only hollow, uh, because of the tradition there in Sweden, the king owned the biggest part of the tree. Essentially, you couldn't cut that, but you can keep the branches small in diameter uh, and pruning those. And uh, so there are these just ridiculously looking trees, which are just beautiful specimens uh, throughout the, the woodlands, uh, at least the parts that I've, I've been around Stockholm. And there are some, you know, there are some examples of this knowledge coming to arboriculture. So for example, here's a hundred or so of about 7,000 trees that went in to Apple's headquarters uh, over the past eight years or so, and a uh, very trained uh, individual. In fact, one of my co-authors on this little guy right here, his crew went into the nurseries and actually pruned all the trees themselves or trained very meticulously the, the, the nursery staff to prune these corcus in this example to the dominant leader uh, format. And so here we are in the streets of Melbourne, Australia, and you can see a pretty good example of a small aspect ratio. They use a lot of plane trees there, London plane trees, on the left. So most of those branches, if you look, are small aspect ratio, small compared to the trunk. And then right across the street, literally, so this tree is this one right here. So right across the street from the hotel downtown, I think it was a Hilton or something, is a completely different structured tree. And so which one, that or this, would you rather be managing along the streets of your community? I will ask you that, OK? Just hope you don't have to answer, but just think about which one. In, in my view and experience, this one is so much easier to lift. And then people can see storefronts, signs. They can see out, in this case, out of the condominiums. Here, there's wood in the way. You know what's going to hit. The future of these two are going to be nothing but out and then down. And then we have to make a big pruning cut at the base. Seems, seems rather uh, silly in, in hindsight. <clears throat> so when we prune to keep the branches small, what's the influence of the amount we take off of the, the branches that are pruned? What's the influence of the amount? versus the response. So I want to show you a study, because this was supposed to be practical experience and research, I think is what was in the title. So I, you know, that's my mission. So we, uh, we, we, we 
approach this in two ways. I'll show you the trees in just a second. We measured the basal diameter, the, the cross-sectional area at the base of the stems we were going to prune, where they met the trunk. And then we measured the trunk at the same point. So we had the, the union, I'll show you a picture in a second. So we measured the basal area, and then we, we made pruning cuts until we reached the targeted dose. I'll show you that in a second. At the same time, we made this pretty meticulous measurement of the base of the prune branch and then all the, the, the areas of the pruning cuts we made out on that branch. At the same time, we then estimated, two people estimated individually, independently, how much was on the ground compared to what we started with on that branch. So we wanted to calibrate an actual measurement with how good can people be at doing this visually. Does that make sense? Because at least in the, in the national standard for in America, the, uh, the percentage uh, um, uh, removed is also based on, on a visual. My experience has been we're really bad at estimating. Uh, there's a lot of variability. I can remember doing it in Italy and every place I go and there's usually a hundred percent difference in, in, in the answers when we ask people how much is on the ground. So that was kind of a, a, a practical check on can we can we estimate how much was actually removed there. So here are the trees that we used Tree Fund helped us out uh, over the years, probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. So shout out to them for sure. So what we did was uh, many of the trees had co-dominant stems. So for example, we would uh, prune on this one and not prune on the slightly larger one because they weren't exactly the same size typically. So we would prune the smaller one and not prune the, the larger. One. So here's a pruning cut. So we would have measured the basal area where this joined with the trunk down here below the screen someplace, and then added up the basal areas of all the pruning cuts on that branch. And that's how we either removed none, 25, 50, or, or 75 percent of the foliage. Everybody know what we did now then? That's pretty clear, right? It's, it's straightforward. So this, uh, for example, calculating what percent was taken off of this branch here. We, we would add up the cross-sectional areas of all those cuts. There's probably eight or so cuts there. We would measure the, the basal area or, or cross-sectional area there at the base. The pruning cuts are here off screen, up, up above. Just do simple math, and there's our percentage. So that's how we did it. It's very quantifiable and very repeatable. So three years later, I think this was three years later, yeah. So what you're looking at is basal area growth. So cross-sectional area growth in the prune side, and that's the lighter side, or the unpruned side. So the unpruned side and the pruned side. All right, so I lined it up in the same position. So the, the unpruned and the pruned. So let's do the prune first. So as we pruned, we got less growth in that prune side over the three years. Not surprising. What, one thing that was surprising is just how much slower. When you nail it with 75%, you really slow it down. And sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to do 100%. It's got to come off. So. And so here the stem that was not pruned, uh, in fact, this was not pruned at all, right? No pruning on this tree at all. So the stem grew a little bit more than the what would have been the prune side, but this was the check, so it did not get pruned. But look how much growth we forced into the leader when we pruned either 25 or 50 percent off. That was kind of interesting, right? So we're taking away resources from the pruned side, not taking away resources from the unpruned side. So the unpruned side responded by increasing its, its growth. But when we got to the 75 percent, we did not stimulate growth. Notice there's a letter B on top of each of those bars. So no, no difference in, uh, we did not stimulate central leader growth when we took 75% off of the co-dominant stem. Good, clear with that? You may or may not agree with it, but as long as we're clear. My mission is to be clear. That is my mission in life as I get older. I don't want to be misunderstood. So here's an example uh, on the streets, right? So there's a before and there's an after. Can you see the pruning cut in that little guy right there? So the recent ANSI A300, the American National Standard for, uh, for Pruning, uh, asks the arborist 
or the specifier to essentially an answer five questions. What system are we using? Natural system, I'm not going to go into any detail on what that is uh, right now. I'd be glad to chat with you about it. Our objective here was to subordinate all stems competing with the leader. In this case, there was how many? One. We're going to we're going to pick on those branches and prune only those that are bigger than half the size of the trunk. So you would measure that here or, and there. You'd visually estimate it. Most people would not measure it. And those are the ones you're going you're gonna to work on. You're gonna, either going to remove it or reduce it. We, we chose to reduce it with a half inch cut. So a very simple language. If you had 150 or 500 trees of that size to prune, pretty simple. Uh, approach to that. You might, um, you, you might have a, 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 a number of cuts here. You may say four to five cuts, and this tree would only need one, but maybe the other trees had more uprights and more competitors, and you want to, uh, to, to prune on some of those. So here's the tree two years later. All right, so there's the pruning cut, and then five years later. Can you see the pruning cut that we made? So in that five years, we converted a stem, you know, a, a double leader essentially, to one leader and a branch. So that stem became a branch. And so now you've got a nice lead, and that's how you end up producing this uh, wonderful habit uh, or structure or architecture of, of the plant. So we started out with a double. We ended up uh, with, uh, with a single. So here's a corcus. You guys grow as we do. It's our national tree in the states. Take a few seconds to determine, because location is where, location of the cuts. Where are you going to make the cuts? We're not going to say an ounce about how to make the cuts. You know, that information has been around a long time. But where are we going to make them in this tree? Take a few seconds. Takes me just a few seconds. All right, pick a branch. Just pick one. Is that one of them? Is that one of them? Is that one of them? How about that one? Yeah. All right, what do they have in common? They are, they have a large aspect ratio. aspect ratio, right? Very easy to describe. You know, it's kind of a weird word, or call it diameter ratio, branch to stem diameter ratio. It's just longer and kind of messy. Aspect ratio is just shorter, and it's been in the literature quite a while, 60 years in forestry, probably 15 in arboriculture. So those are the ones we're going to work on. Are we going to remove them, or are we going to reduce them? or we're going to do nothing? What do you think? You want to remove some? How many are going to remove some and reduce some? Nicely done. All right, so I would probably, the way we're going to approach this, there's the after situation on the right. So we remove three in, in the white, and we reduce the one. So you say, well, maybe that's, you might be saying to yourself, well, that's too much, or that's not enough. I would. Say again? Right, it's on one, they're all on the right hand side of the tree. Correct, absolutely. So here's the tree uh, before and after. There we are one year later, and then three years later. So what we did is we took a bush, you with me? I mean, I'm using that word freely, right? We're taking a sort of a multi stem developing shrub, and we made a tree out of it. So future clearance now, is it easier now than, bef than if we had just left the tree unpruned? Absolutely, because now we can come back next time and lift or raise the canopy as high as, as we'd like. And it's, you've got the branch protection zone is intact because small aspect ratio, you know, gives us a very strong branch protection zone at the base. And so it's a no-brainer for the tree. Handles it, says, thank you very much, sir. May I have another? So we just developed a prescription, all right? So let's go through with the natural system. And that's as opposed to pollarding and top and uh, topiary and so forth, pleaching. So it's the natural system. It's, how, it's what we do for most trees. Two objectives, improve architecture and provide clearance. That's what we did. We, we improved architecture. And we provided clearance, so we certainly made future clearance a lot easier. You can now take a very unskilled person and go out, show them how to make pruning cuts, only show them how to make pruning cuts, only work on the bottom eight feet of the tree, and they can take those branches off. 
and that person doesn't have to be as well trained as the person that that looks at that and goes, where do I start? And then we're going to work with, in this case, and you can, this number can be whatever you want it to be. It depends on the trees and what they look like and, and what you want to do with them. But in this case, half the diameter of the trunk. And we're going to make three removal cuts is what we did. And there were that many, uh, that size, and then looks like one reduction cut. So if you were going to spec this whole, this whole meeting of trees, there's probably 60 or 70 trees there you wouldn't go to every tree. You'd look at each tree, sort of do a survey. You might even write some numbers down for each tree, how many cuts that tree needs, what type, how big, how many cuts that, tri that tree needs, how much, how big. And just do a little sort of timber cruise. That's where my forestry background comes in, right? Just do a little cruise, like 10% of the trees, look at six trees out of the 60, and uh, come up with a, with a specification or prescription that would look uh, like that. Standards are great. We have standards. We've had standards a long time in the US and other countries have for sure. And uh, I applaud the European group for, uh, for going after the, you know, the larger that would encompass uh, 12 countries or whatever it is, 11, 10, 11, I think it's 10 countries. And that's fantastic. But it's only a start. What the way we've used our standard is to is for a vocabulary bank to use those words and those concepts to write prescriptions. That, that's where the rubber meets the road in teaching ourselves, our colleagues, our employees how to prune trees, right, right there. That's it. And you know, one way to look at this is no tree or group of trees should be pruned without a prescription. You know, and a, a work order is a prescription. You know, you're going out to do work, that's a prescription. So according to the standards that, uh, that um, America uh, uses, those are, the, f those are the, the four, and there's actually five in there. They're combined. Those are the things that we want you to consider answering. All right, let's talk about pruning at planting. Controversial. I'm going to make some people mad now, but that's OK. It's all right. We're, uh, um, we're, we can still be friends. Now, what I'm going to show you is that many failures and branches that interfere with stuff in the urban environment, you know, all the things we know about building signs, traffic lights, etc. many to most of those branches were on the tree when the tree was planted. Just think about, think about that for a second. And we'll see that outside all over campus when we walk tomorrow. So here's why is the branch architecture at planting may not be ideal. So when growers present a central leader to you, uh, and many of the trees here are not the ligustrum, but these other things, I guess I can't tell anybody what they are, right? Because that's part of the game here. <laughs> and then that thing over there on the right kind of looks like a taxodium, but it's not. <laughs> That's not too much of a hint, I guess. Um, yeah, so they're, um, they've got a nice leader there. However, what often comes along with the leader, and I don't see it so much with these plants in the room, but looking outside, we'll see, is six to 10 branches that make up the bottom and widest portion of the crown. And those are often oriented in which direction? Sort of like this or like this even, especially at the tips. And so when they get planted out into the landscape, and the, uh, who prunes trees mostly? Arborists or non-arborists? Small trees. Non-arborists. Non-arborists, agreed, absolutely. So when the non-arborist comes, doesn't know this information, maybe doesn't know a leader from a haircut, they are going to take off secondary branches. They're not going to make reduction cuts. They're not going to go up to the top of these limbs and make reduction cuts to reduce them, I think. And so that's what I mean by the branch architecture not being 100% ideal. It may be good enough, but we've got to work it at planting because I'm going to show you what happens. So here's a, a group of maples we pruned. So we produced these from little cuttings and then grew them up into 45-gallon containers. And you see they've got a pretty good structure. Up at the top, we've got a leader to the top. But look at all the company that leader has at the top. See all that company up there? In which direction are they growing? Pretty much upright, right? 
So they are all smaller in diameter than the trunk now. So they'll meet a specification that you write where all branches shall be smaller than the size of the trunk or have an aspect ratio less than x. They would meet that spec. But watch what happens. I'm going to shrink that photo down a little bit. It's the same tree, same photo. You plant it in the ground and everything grows because what are the two things that we're keeping those branches kind of suppressed in the nursery? Two things. The next tree in the line and here's a hint. The grower, right, the grower. So they were keeping it because you'll see if you look there and you look at, at many of the trees uh, on display here on, inside the building, you can see the pruning cuts where the growers have reduced so that you don't get this candelabra. Am I right? So they grow, grow, and here's, here's a close-up of this part of the tree, and you can see we've got a, a codominant stem on a maple. Is that, is that a strong union on a maple? It, not in my experience, not at all. I mean, these are, I've gone through a lot of hurricanes, six or seven, including one that came 40 miles from my house last week. <laughs> uh, the two days before I came here, I almost emailed you and said, it doesn't look good, buddy. But, you know, we've missed so many that uh, I didn't bother doing that. So you can see what happens. These were on the tree when the tree was planted. Those two were on the tree when the tree was planted. And then the trees grow. This is the same genus, different species probably. It's probably Freeman maple or something. But you can see co-dominant stems, bark inclusions there at the base. Here's a golf course in western North Carolina. Let's take a close-up of that area, and you'll find this. The trees on the golf course are, are failing. So my question to you is, were those branches that failed on the tree when the tree was planted? Well, yeah. Yeah, you know, here was my estimate of the, what the crown looked like, you know, more or less, you know, thinner at the top, wider at the bottom. So, codon bark inclusion, bark inclusion, bark inclusion, and so this could have been prevented, at least on this part of the tree, if the tree was pruned at planting. Little sucker tears, a couple, three little snips, and we'd be done. And I too follow trees, and I'm older than Duncan, so I have even older. <laughs> and this is the 10 year I should go back to campus we're probably at about 20 years now but that bark inclusion that's the same tree 10 years later here you see a partial bark inclusion a total bark inclusion from here up and this my best estimate of that same portion of the tree and you can see just how much more total bark inclusion has developed in those uh, 10 years folks it's like tooth decay it doesn't heal itself. Ever, ever notice that? You gotta go to the dentist to get it fixed. So suppressing and reducing these competing stems is, is simple in concept, but people will leave a room and they will freeze outside. And, and it's, so it, it just takes practice. It takes not all that much practice. You practice on your neighbor's trees and then you, and then you, you watch how they respond. So, so you either prune lightly, you're using reduction cuts typically, and some removal cuts. Here we've got two redu three reduction cuts, a mild and then more aggressive dose. So what would you do here then for, uh, for this trick? This is a maple or an ash, as I remember. Let's just keep it a maple, because ash, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ship it anywhere, right? You wouldn't bother pruning it, I guess, right? Three cuts. All right, you got a cut or two or three? Yep, something like this. All right, we've got a nice lead after we're done. We've got one, two, three reductions. There's a removal up there. There's a reduction there, reduction, reduction, reduction. That's a nice presentation now. It's got the typical classic nursery pyramidal shape that people have come to expect. So what, are the, what was probably one of the reasons why that tree did that? Well, probably a heading cut there. And you can see that in some of the trees in the hallway here. And then the grower comes back and corrects the response, right? The tree responds to a heading cut, two to four buds, closest to the heading cut, go upright. And we saw that in, well, we saw it before the break, you know, where the cuts are made at the top of the tree in these veteran trees, and everything grows from the top. You don't stimulate lower branches by pruning the top uh, of the tree. So what would you do here for this corcus? 
Pretty simple, straightforward. Okay, here's a good way to, to teach yourself. Just go through the three steps. Where's the leader? Where's the competition? Where do I cut the competition back to? Where's the leader? Where's the competition? Where do I cut the competition back to? Those three steps. So now we, and notice we, we kept all the low branches intact here in this uh, wonderful uh, park next to a river. So we got a nice leader there. How about that Acer? You got a plan? What kind of, what kind of cuts are you going to make here? We got heading, reduction, removal. What kind of cuts do you think you're going to need to make? What do you think, Philip? Reduction. Reduction? What else? Because maples don't branch a whole lot on the current year's growth, right? So on, on trees that do that, like maples, we're going to have to make some heading cuts. If you look really close up at the top, you'll see some, some heading cuts. For example, there's a heading cut. You know, I try, to grow, I try to cut it back to a bud because a little dead stub doesn't look great, but it's not the end of the world if you leave an inch or so uh, stub on that, certainly, at all. Not the end of the world. So research on this. There's two studies that would relate to arboriculture. One was done in Copenhagen by the urban forester there, uh, Christofferson. I met him a couple years ago at uh, the meeting uh, up north here, or wherever it is. Yeah, yeah, north, north, northwest of here. And then we picked up, in 2014, we picked up uh, a study that, that uh, wanted to see what would happen if we pruned a planting versus not. So we, uh, we've, we got five, we got six rows of trees. You're seeing two rows here. There's four other rows behind me. And some were not pruned at planting. Another group was pruned at planting. And here we are one year later. And if you look real carefully, you can see the reduction cuts there on that, that row of trees. And so one year after pruning, the results were we had better structure. And we lost that much growth. So it was about three millimeters of growth. You'd have to measure it to see it. So the, the trees that were not pruned increased by about one inch in caliper. The trees that were pruned were that much less. So does that mean anything to us? No, it doesn't mean anything to us. I'd rather have, I, I would spend that to get better structure. Does that make sense? So you're spending a little bit of growth to get better structure. We pulled the trees, they're all equally stable. There's no difference in stability of the trees, so we're guessing the root system had, had little or no influence. So when you make these reduction cuts on, say, a near codominant stem, they're nearly the same size. Here we are one year later. See how we changed that? Here we are four years later on the right. See how it's the same branch, right? See how we changed that? Now we've got an inclusion because of the angle here, so an inclusion began. Uh, to develop, but you know we couldn't help that on this particular branch. At least it's small compared to the trunk. If we had let it go, we'd probably have an inclusion on a codominant stem. And here we are in Oslo. I took a walk. Uh, where, I think Vicky, you were there too. Uh, I took a walk behind a train station. They had a whole row about 200 trees: Gladysia, Zelkova, all kinds of stuff. Lots of North America, Thuja, and others. And you can see um, lots of reduction cuts here. So th it's, there are people, you can find places on the planet where people are actually doing this, like uh, the Apple campus, for example, with 7,000 trees. All right, so maple. We're actually, we're, we're running a little short of time, so we're going to go through this maple quickly. There's before pruning Acer. We've got what was the canopy of the nursery-grown tree. I'm going to blow it up so you can see what it looked like. Here's the leader, but a lot of friends up there. And each of those friends are going to grow, and that's how this triple leader developed. They all grew after planting. There was technically a leader, but those could have been pruned at planting. Here we are after the first structural pruning, and that's what we took off. Was it too much? Here's, a, here's another year after that pruning on the left. So there's one year after pruning on the left. And here we are pruned the second time. So before and after pruning, this is 12 months after the first pruning. You see all the reduction cuts up there. Here's what was on the ground. Notice it's a lot less. So better to take care of the situations first and then get the big stuff out of the tree. And then the second, third time. It usually takes three times to get a tree that hasn't been pruned. A young tree, you know, this size range and smaller, three times to get a handle on the structure of that tree. It's been my experience uh, over a long period of time. 
So here we are three years after the first printing and another two years, so if my math's right, that's five or six years. So we created what was a developing shrub into kind of a tree, you know, tree. If you look up in the Webster's Dictionary, some other dictionaries, definition of a tree, almost every definition mentions the word a trunk or one trunk. It's amazing, Webster's figured it out, I think we can too. We're arborists. All right, what would you do for this liquid ambar? Sweet gum. You got a plan? What do you think? Pretty simple, straightforward, right? So we could either remove or reduce. We, we chose to reduce the big one and uh, re reduced a whole bunch more. There's a reduction cut. We got a beautiful leader that's going to make a nice future there for, for the urban forest. So we, we got a hold of some, some, um, some money, a really big machine, and uh, blew some trees 120 miles an hour. We had a whole bunch of fun, and here's a tree blowing 120 miles an hour. Uh, to give you some sense for what we did, we grew trees from cuttings so they were genetically identical. Some were reduced, some were thinned, some were raised. So the canopy started here, we raised it, and then this is unpruned. So we had four treatments, and we had four of each. So 16, or we had five of each. So we had 20 trees in the study. So what we were mimicking, we're, we were trying to, to say, okay, how could we prune that tree, or sh what is the response to pruning that tree in those three different ways? And we're, we're hoping that it, it, it makes some facsimile to, um, and I know there's a lot of problems with this, but we're, we, we wanted to get some sense for what would be the best approach to pruning a tree like this 80-foot uh, liquid dam bar. So the first thing we found is we had to find a way to measure dose because we had to take the same amount of foliage off of the, the raised, the thin, and the reduced, same amount of foliage. So we measured lots of branch diameters and plucked all the foliage off and weighed the foliage. <laughs> oh, that was fun. We squared the, the branch diameter and it was a straight line relationship between the weight of the foliage distal to the cut and the size of the cut. And we published this, I don't know, 10 years ago or six, eight years ago or something. So it's in the arboriculture and urban forestry. So we would measure the diameters of all this, calculate the cross-sectional area, pull up our fancy big wind machine that was run by lots of horsepower. It was at the time the largest portable wind tunnel in the world, lots of power. And we would pull it up to the poor tree and we blow the stew out of it. If we had time, I'd show you the videos, but if you go on the website, you can see, you can see the video. So there we are blowing and uh, you know, recording devices, uh, anemometer and so forth, and up to about 120 miles an hour. This is kind of the, a key graph. So we had in the trees, we had tilt sensors. So we had three of them. And we're, I'm just gonna show you the top one. It was about five feet from the top of the tree. And it's just measuring tilt. So here's the non-pruned, and this is wind speed up to 100 miles an hour here. I just cut it off at 100, so 40 to 100. There's five trees in here, right? There's five trees in here, there's five in here. You can kind of see this is three and there's two there, and then reduced. So the way I look at that, and the stats came out this way, this was technically less um, uh, motion, so, so this is slope here, this is 50 degrees down here, so th th these are only, only going about uh, 14 or 13 degrees at the top, so it's not moving very much. The unpruned trees, this one tree went way down here to 60 degrees, I mean it really leaned over, and these others were scattered, but look what reduction does to predictability you know exactly what that tree's gonna do. I mean, there's five trees in there, so there's no spread at all, they're all on that line, that's pretty cool. They almost never does that. So here's the, the 60 degree uh, tilt at the, at the top of the tree. And here's the reduced. So you can see a tremendous difference in, uh, in the response uh, to that different pruning. All right, let's talk about overextended branches. I, I wish we knew what that meant. It's, it's a pretty big can of worms. There's no tables I'm aware of. There's, there's very few, if any, guidelines out there. And it's, it's a sense, I guess, that we get, isn't it? I guess it's a sense. 
So here's the Florida champion of, uh, of Quarkus virginiana. It's about 13 feet in diameter, uh, more or less, 12 and a half, 13 feet in diameter, and it broke. So what, uh, what, what we think this research suggests is that reducing at the periphery, working the periphery back, is going to prevent that wood from moving around. And being in a lot of hurricanes and watching trees, literally watching trees break, uh, and I could show you lots of videos uh, in Gainesville and the two towns I lived in in North Florida. The, the trees break when a gust comes and the wood bends a lot. So if we can reduce bending, now I, we were chatting earlier about uh, the fact that reduction does just what I'm showing you here, reduces bending and you have, have now a stiff element here and you could probably make a case for, for that uh, creating more bending stress at the base of the tree. But it reduces the breakage up in the crown, in the canopy, and you have a lot less foliage up there, of course it will grow back. So when a branch or a tree especially is reduced, that's an in perpetuity practice, I believe. I believe we should at least be considering that. The last thing I wanted to share with you is uh, this tree with one crack, about six feet long, with a rib of tissue, that's closed over on that side. Target just over here. There's many homes right across here, so we have a target. And so we're going to use the natural system. We want to reduce risk. We're going to work on the two or three largest branches. We're going to use reduction cuts, and these are the cuts. You can see them. There's one there, and there's the arborist up on the left for scale, so the, and there's some cuts on the right. The idea is here, and you see the debris on the ground, that the, the tree is going to sprout and it's going to fill in. We left that circled area, come back to that in just a second. The tree is going to sprout, more growth is going to be pushed up in the center, and we hope to reduce the likelihood of that, that lead falling out of the plant. 2014, we came back. We then uh, we're going to work on that area of the tree that we left last time, so we took enough off here. And there's, there's the arborist there. He had made the cut already, there's before and after it's a four and a half inch cut. Here we are 2017, you get a sense for the fill in that's occurring over the pruning cut. So from these branches here, and there's some sprouts coming up in here. There's another tree in the way here, so it's, it's a little muddy there. And there's a close up of that. And then here we are in, in and there's the pruning cuts that we did uh, there. I had the privilege to work with Mark Chisholm that day. That was pretty awesome. So there is five years of change in that tree. You can see how the lead is starting to come and, and dominate the plant. A little bit more like a forest grown tree. Here we are 2019, just a few months ago, we did a, a circuit out there through California and we're going back to the same parks. For, this is the fifth time we've gone back over about 11 years to the same trees, same parks, it's pretty cool. And so we worked the top, we, <laughs> I pointed, Mark, <laughs> Mark did the cutting and uh, work the top of the tree and you can just, because there's a, a co-dominant stem up here and Mark told us that there was a bark inclusion in the top there and so we made some cuts mostly up in that, uh, in that area. There's 2012 to 2019. So summary then would be uh, typically worldwide we see a lot of this lion's tailing and Hong Kong showed us a lot there. What we just, just, just spent a few moments on instead is going up making some strategic reduction cuts so that if, when we have to remove those, they're small in diameter and to reduce the likelihood of failure. We, we spoke about aspect ratio and the importance of that, how it could be a guiding principle for developing a pruning approach to trees, and we talked about reducing uh, end weight. So I really appreciate your time. Thanks very much, and I uh, will see you tomorrow. Out. Thanks a lot. So that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed that edition of Tree of the Best. That was Tree of the Best 4. We'll hope to have another one out to you in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully you're all staying well and hopefully you've all managed to check out the, all of the online content we've been putting out from the association. It's all stored on our online learning pages on the website. There's loads of it there and we're pretty much adding to it every week now. So there should be plenty there to keep you educated and informed and hopefully entertained as well. And remember to check out the Virtual Arb Show, which is starting uh, this week, unless you're watching this in the future, in which case I hope we all survived.
and uh, the Arb Show was probably a great success. Take care of yourselves. See you soon. Bye-bye.